Jim, this has been a season of disasters. Lots and lots of disasters. So we started off with Hurricane Harvey. So you've got the dates there, August 25th to the 29th. And then right on the heels of Harvey was Hurricane Irma, September 8th through 11th. And right there we had the 7.1 magnitude earthquake in central Mexico. And the following day, Maria hits Puerto Rico. And then we have forest fires destroying most of Napa Valley and the Sonoma region of California. And it's been one disaster after another. And so over and over we hear the Red Cross and we hear our local news stations saying, you know, please donate. And there's repeated requests for, can you help donate? And everybody wants to help. There are pitches left and right. And so here on campus, we had from Ohio to Texas, college campuses uniting. We had opportunities to donate. And the question becomes, how do we, how do, we do this? What's the best way to help? How do we make a difference? And how do we know? Are we doing the best that we can do? So we had the ONU. Um, UMCOR, David McDonald was putting out the notion that we could help to put together disaster buckets. And so this was the email that he sent out uh, to campus. Thanks to your generosity, we were able to raise 700 toward hurricane relief, and we were able to put together 20 flood buckets. And those flood buckets were the five gallon pails, and in those pails, there were a variety of things, including wet wipes, uh, Clorox wipes, and various cleaning supplies that would then be distributed to various homes for the flood victims who were cleaning up and, and those kinds of things. And that was done through the United Methodist uh, Committee on Relief that was being handed out. And so, one of the things that happens when we have a season like this one, where we have issue after issue after issue after issue, is we barely got through one disaster when we heard about the next one. And about the time that Hurricane Harvey hit hit and Irma was on the radar, we quit hearing about Harvey. And you might have thought that everybody in Houston was just fine, except they weren't. But it wasn't in the news anymore because the next big disaster was. And then Maria comes along and Harvey and Irma and those folks are all fine because Maria's here, but they're not. And so what we have is this perfect storm of crises. And in order to understand really what happens here, we have to understand a little bit about agenda setting theory. So we have to understand a little bit about communication and what happens. So there's this communication theory called agenda setting theory that says, whoops, that says that the media has the ability to set the agenda for what the population thinks about and what they understand and what they're talking about. And so what the community or what the population is thinking about is based upon what the media is talking about on any given day. And McCombs and Shaw, these two theorists in communication, were actually able to demonstrate that the media really does do this because they created these fake newscasts by switching around the order of some subjects that were in the news and broadcasting them to people. And what they found was the things that show up in the news first and get the most attention are the things that people talk about and rate as being the most important. They didn't take anything out of the news. They just ordered them differently. And those things that showed up first were viewed as being the most important. And that's what the public ranked as being most important. And so we know that the media really does shape what people talk about and what they think about. So there is no way that everybody in Japan is fully recovered and that that nuclear plant that started to melt down from the Fukushima, the Fukushima plant, there's no way that that is completely resolved. And you all haven't thought about the Fukushima plant until I just now brought it up for months and months and months and maybe even well over a year. But it's not in the media. It's not what we're thinking about. And it's not on our radar. 
and the same thing begins to happen with these disasters. As soon as Harvey's off our radar and another disaster hits, that's what we're now thinking about. And so we had five major, major, major disasters right here in our own country, in our own locality, if you include Mexico. And each one superseded the next, and pretty soon the people in Houston, they're way off the radar. That's five disasters removed. That's one issue. The other issue is this thing called donor fatigue. Everybody gave very, very, very generously to Hurricane Harvey. And then we had Irma, and then we had Maria, and now we're down to Puerto Rico. And if you've been following what's going on in Puerto Rico, it's grim. It's really grim. So the night before last, I was at the FIMU Delta. I'm a, an advisor for that fraternity, and I was at their Thanksgiving dinner. And Dave Smittle, who was their past advisor, was there. And he has a fraternity brother who has a place in Puerto Rico. And there are no, there's, the mail is going through, but FedEx and UPS can't deliver, they're, or they're not delivering. But the mail is, first class priority mail is getting through. The things that they're sending down right now are batteries and battery-operated fans, and mosquito spray, and mosquito nets. That's what the people need desperately, because we have Zika virus, and there's no air conditioning, and there's no electricity, nor will there be electricity. How long? Oh, the news is telling you mm, maybe seven or eight months. The reality is from the people who are actually on the ground there, it's going to be well over a year before the grid is back up, maybe longer than that. The grid was in such bad shape that a year is really probably pretty hopeful for the entire island to have the grid back up because the grid was in such bad shape. Um, but what do they really need? Clothes probably isn't one of the things that they really, really need, but what do they need? And how do we know? And people are kind of tired of getting asked to give and give and give and give. And that's what we call donor fatigue. We get asked to donate a lot. And if you get asked too much, and if you hit up your donors too much, the donors say, enough, I'm done. I don't have more to give. So these are some of the issues we face. So then the question becomes, is your donation really working like you would like for it to work? So if you've paid attention at all to the news, there's a lot of uh, headlines out there about what's going on with our donations and are, are, are these organizations doing what they should be doing and are they being honest with our funds and everything else. So, oh, you know what, I did this. Pardon me here for a second, okay. So this was one of my favorite um, stories that came out this fall. At least one city leader is questioning the Red Cross's choice of hotels while coming to Houston to help with Harvey Relief. City Councilman Dave Martin dubbed the charity Red Loss. He made the point last week at City Hall claiming he hadn't seen the charity in his district. Five days later, they still haven't shown up in Kingwood, Martin claims. Flood victims like Robert Leggett, who live in Kingwood, echo his complaints. I haven't seen them. I've been, almost, been there almost every day. But that's not what has Martin really upset. ABC 13 investigates found Red Cross vans parked outside the hotel, and it's a five-star hotel. Okay? Some of the luckiest Red Cross volunteers are staying the night at the St. Regis Hotel, one of the city's finest five-star places to spend the night. The Red Cross admits it had 20 volunteers staying there for days on end due to, quote, limited availability, they say, in the Houston area. I totally understand what the optics might look like on that, but it's not something we do routinely, Red Cross spokesman Charles Blake said. It probably does send the wrong message. We got a very discounted rate at the St. Regis. The charity paid $179 a night, and it said it was doubling people up in each room. Two people a room, 179 a night, 20 people, do the math. That's a lot of money. 
why aren't the Red Cross volunteers staying on cots in the Civic Center where the other folks are staying? Why are they staying in a five-star hotel? Now, I don't know how many of you donated money, but if you're donating money to the Red Cross, and it's the Red Cross volunteers and not the victims who are staying in a five-star hotel, just saying. And these are the kinds of things that people have issue with. And the Red Cross gets accused of these kinds of things on a fairly regular basis. And they come under fire fairly regularly for this kind of thing. Uh, the Red Cross, as recently as Hurricane Sandy, was accused of driving trucks around empty just so it looked like they had a presence in the neighborhoods of Hurricane Sandy. And that was another uh, issue that came up and has been validated and, and things. So one of the things you can do is when you're looking at organizations and you're trying to find out, am I donating in a place that I want to be donating? And is my dollar going to where I want it to be going to? You can check out various websites. One of those websites is CharityNavigator.com. And Charity Navigator can tell you a lot about what this organization is doing, how it's using its monies, et cetera. They score all organizations out of 100. Red Cross only gets a 77 and a half. That's a good C for their financial expenditures. If you look further down, you can see in terms of their expenses how they use their funds. They spend six cents out of every dollar on fundraising. So for every dollar that you give, six cents of that's going to go back into active fundraising advertisements, other kinds of attempts to raise more money. Now, that's how you know about the Red Cross. You wouldn't know that they existed if they weren't out there advertising. You've probably never heard of Solid Rock International. That's because if I were to pull up Solid Rock International <clears throat> on Charity Navigator, you'll find out that they don't do hardly any advertising. That's not where their money goes. Their money goes right back to the, the folks out there. Same is true with the United Way. If you look up the United Way, they spend some money doing advertising. There's a marketing component to it. There are trade-offs, but this is one way that you can take a look at what they do. Um, administrative, the expense breakdown here for administrative, 4%. Okay? And you can look these pieces of information up to learn about your organization. Now here's the United Methodist Organization's breakdown. If we come down and look at their graphs and see, their fundraising is a whopping 1%. So it's a, it's, that's quite a difference from the Red Cross, and you don't see advertisements from UMCOR out there. So these are some of the things to think about when you're thinking, oh, do I want to put my money here, or do I want to donate my efforts elsewhere? There's an awful lot of organizations out there that you've never even heard of before, and there's a lot of causes you've not ever heard of before. So one of the things that struck me with Hurricane Harvey was an appeal from Brene Brown. Anybody know Brene Brown? No one? OK. Brene Brown is a popular um, author. She is a social worker from the University of Houston. She does a lot of research, but she's also written a ton of books for the popular lay audience um, about relationships and bettering oneself, self-improvement kinds of things. So she multi. New York Times, almost every book hits the top seller list within at release. So she was on her Facebook page. She put out a plea, and this is her plea. Hi, everyone. It's Brene. Um, it's Wednesday, and I'm coming live from NRG. They have had a massive call for licensed social workers. So I've been here all day volunteering with other social workers, medical personnel, volunteers.
Um, if you are licensed in social work in Houston, uh, they need your help, uh, medical intake, assessments. Um, look, everyone has been asking about what you can do to help, and I'm going to ask you for what we really need because this is not a community that needs things to be free or wrapped in a bow. We need underwear. Um, we need underwear for people because here's the thing, people donate these clothes, they do not donate used underwear, and there's a shortage. And Underwear for everyone, and these for everyone, is a nonprofit I'm involved with here. All the information is in the post below. Um, I am 100% confident in the stewardship of the money. Um, but here's the thing even in a non tragic disaster like this, people start periods, people have accidents, grown ups, kids, and some parents lose jobs if they leave to bring the underwear. Um, Right now, it's one thing that people don't have, and I think we all know underwear is something we take for granted until we don't have it. It's really a dignity issue. It's about smelling. It's about not being clean. It's about being rashes. So if you can look at the contact information below, we need underwear, and Undies for Everyone is somebody I can really vouch for. There may be another call next week for something, but right now, panties, send us chones as my mother-in-law likes to call them. Men's, women's, I'll give all the information below. And keep thinking about us. It's as bad as it looks on TV. Thank you. OK, so this is an example of something we just don't think about. When there's a disaster and you think, what can I do or what can I send? You know what? If I'd been out of my house and I had nothing but what was on my back, and three days later, yeah, I'd be pretty desperate for a nice clean pair. I don't know about the rest of you. But this made all kinds of sense to me. And so what she had done, and she used her positioning as a very well-known authority who could say, this is an organization, I can vouch for it. And they set it up on gift donations on Amazon. So you could go onto Amazon, you could click, you could give it as a gift. It went right to the organization, and it could be dispersed to the organization. One of the things that happened with these hurricanes is that people wanted to give things. Convoys after con miles and miles and miles and miles and miles of trucks sat on freeways, unable to go anywhere because it was a flood. They couldn't go anywhere. So there were trucks and trucks and trucks of stuff that could not be delivered because the logistics didn't allow for it to happen. So while people meant well, there was no way to get it to the people who really needed it. So donating it to places that understand the best way to do the logistics makes a lot of sense. And so this, this setup allowed them to be able to work with undies for everyone and to be able to distribute it in a way that made sense. The other thing to do is to look local. So there's an organization called indivisible.org this was their message for about Houston. Um, and so this individual posted a blog, but then here down at the bottom of the blog, he talked about various places with general assistance, food bank, child care, um, undocumented individuals in Houston, people with disability, and all kinds of organizations where you could donate to help, ways to advocate, and ways to give back. One of the current sites that's been set up is Unidos. It's, a, it's with the Hispanic Federation. Lynn, Man, Lynn Manuel, okay, the individual who wrote um, Hamilton. He has been working with this particular organization to raise funds through the Hispanic Federation. His grandparents were from Puerto Rico, and so he has been raising funds through this particular organization. Um, along, Mayor de Blasio has been supporting this organization along to raise money. They are raising money for Puerto Rico. They are also raising money for the Dominican Republic, for Barbuda, and other um, Hispanic-based islands as a way to get funding where our government has sort of left off and is not completely able to um, address the needs that are there. Okay, so how, what and how? First and foremost, donate cash, money, moolah, whatever you wanna call it, give money, okay? Second, volunteer time. Lastly, think about supplies. 
But the very first thing to donate is money. I know it's not as pretty and glamorous. First of all, logistics are a real nightmare. You start donating clothing or start donating things in the middle of a disaster, the people on the ground are trying to deal with the people. They don't have the time or the energy, nor do they have the space to deal with the stuff that you might be bringing or sending in. There isn't enough human resource or enough space to deal with it. Don't send stuff, not right away. That's the last thing they need to be dealing with. They need to be dealing with the human crisis. Time, donate your time if you have the skill set to be valuable. But if you don't have a skill set that's useful, then you're just in the way, okay? And I tell you that from disaster rescues in Oklahoma and tornadoes. If you don't have the skill set to move heavy debris and you don't have the rescue skills to get people out of a tornado zone, don't go there. You're in the way. And they don't have anywhere to put your supplies either. Not yet. They've got to be further along in the process. Money first, time second. Donations come and goods come quite a ways down the road once things are set up and established. The Dominican work, fine. Those communities are established. They exist. It's not a natural disaster. That's a different kind of thing. But let me tell you why money is good. You can go out and you can buy vitamins. And it's going to cost you retail to buy vitamins. You can give me the money you paid to buy vitamins, or you can give the nurses the money you paid to buy, buy vitamins, and we can take that money and we can go to an organization like Blessings International, which sends medications or sells medications to be used internationally, and we can buy three or four times what you can purchase with what you paid retail for. So. Here's a message from a TV show that you guys all probably know. How many of you know Adam Ruins Everything? True TV? Here's the problem with canned food drives. First, you should know that one in seven Americans rely on food pantries to help feed their families. Exactly. Hunger is a real problem. Yes, but canned food drives are a terrible solution. You know the first thing the food pantry does with our old cans? They throw half of them out. Oh. We tend to use food drives to clean out our cabinets, which means we only donate the food that's so old and gross, even we won't eat it. Loose candy corn. <sighs> Or we'll eat it. Others buy food at full retail price, picking out cans as though they were the needy's personal shopper. Do the poor like original or old and spicy? Original. They're not fancy. Okay, but they're still chipping in free food. <laughs> yeah, dream on, lady. Free? Somebody has to pay to haul all of this stuff to a warehouse. Oh, oh my god. And someone has to sort and throw out all the expired cans. And plus. Canned food is high in sodium, which causes high blood pressure. Well, that's an exaggeration. Your heart wouldn't literally explode. Great work, Tony. But it is true that nearly half the food we donate doesn't meet basic nutritional standards. Okay, so what kind of food do pantries need? I don't know. What do you eat? Me? Oh, well, I really like fruits and veggies. I eat a lot of salads. Oh, and I try to eat lean meats, you know, chicken and turkey and stuff like that and oh, I just love a loaf of fresh crusty bread. Exactly, but you can't donate any of those foods because they're all perishable. Genevieve, would you tell Emily why canned food drives suck? Canned food drives don't suck, but they're not the most efficient way to give. Oh, you run a food bank, don't you? <laughs> yeah, I do. The truth is, the best way to help a food bank is to donate money because we buy food on a wholesale level and we work with farmers so we can take the dollar that you might spend on a single can of beans and turn it into exponentially more food. Hey there folks, I got a delivery here for one dollar's worth of food. I mean comically large amount of food. <laughs> okay, so a little obnoxious in its presentation, yet it kind of makes the point. So 
giving money doesn't seem quite as noble. It's not as tangible. It's not as glamorous and it's not as tangible as giving things, but it really is in terms of doing the best with and the most help in what you donate. It is the most useful thing you can do. So think about where you're putting your dollars. Think about where you're putting your help, how you're donating, because it really does make a difference. And not all aid is good aid. And I guess that would be sort of my final, my bottom line on that. Any questions? You said the Red Cross was one that people usually think is really great, but ends up not being so much. What are some of the other big names that people can say? OK. I, I don't, I don't want to bash, because every single organization has its pros and has its cons. There is no organization that's categorically great and categorically bad, right? Um, some of the organizations that have had problems um, and have been targeted, and some of them that have cleaned up their act. Wounded Warrior Project, um, about a third of their funds were being spent on uh, various forms of administration, administration retreats, administration travel, um, and maybe 50% of it was actually getting out to the vets. Uh, they have begun work to try and turn that around. Uh, the jury's still out to see where that goes. That organization has been under attack strongly. Feed the Children is another one out of Oklahoma City. They have, they have turned their business around or their, their 501c3 around quite a bit, but they also were under attack for a lot of less than ideal practices, kind of like the Red Cross. The Red Cross has tried to turn itself around. Um, their executives, their top executives, are still making mid six figures. They're still in the four and five, four and five hundred thousand dollar figures. Um, you can go to an organization, a website called GuideStar, um, and you can sign up for a free account and you can look at the 990 forms, which is the tax codes, um, 501c3 form that any nonprofit agency has to file every year. And you can see the top paid executives for and what their salaries are. I can tell you that Solid Rock's top, well, they only have two top paid employees because they only have a staff of two here in the United States. But, but their chief operating officer only makes 52000 a year. Um, so they're not living high on the hog by any stretch of the imagination. Um, so you, but you can go into most of these organizations and if they, they have to report those things. So you can find out what the top salaries of many of those organizations are. Um, people have had issue, take issue with Goodwill. Uh, Goodwill stores charge tax. And so people think, oh, Goodwill, it's all tax free. Um, no, their stores are actually for profit. The stores actually make a profit, and that's a part of, so not every aspect of Goodwill is nonprofit, and that rubs some people the wrong way. Uh, Salvation Army will, they have very, very precise practices on where they will and will not give aid based upon their principles and their Christian principles, and that is problematic for some people. So it, it really depends upon what kind of an issue you're asking about in terms of what's problematic. In terms of financial transparency, though some of the big ones, uh, Feed the Children was one. Um, getting better, not great. Red Cross is one. Um, Wounded Warrior Project is one. If you go to Charity Watch, to Charity Navigator, they will tell you the best and the ones to question. And they have like top 10 and bottom 10 lists. I have a question. Just, have you 
to hear your thoughts on differences between disaster donations and then like developmental donations. So the effectiveness of the donating to disasters versus developing countries. Okay. So there's a real difference between disaster relief versus development. So when I teach, a I teach my class on the ethics of international aid, there's charity and there's disaster relief. And then there's development. They are two very, very, very different creatures, OK? Um, charity and disaster relief is what you do in the immediate aftermath of a disaster. Uh, that's free handouts. That's free aid in the face of a crisis. That's free. And that's OK. If we're talking about development, the development models, if we get into the various develop, true development models, development models don't do free handouts. Free handouts will not, you cannot donate people out of poverty. You cannot give handouts to get people out of poverty. So charity will never get people out of and develop them out of a poverty situation. No amount of going and giving away houses in Haiti and building free houses for people is going to change the situation in Haiti. That's a development model. Do they need financial aid? Yeah. But it has to come in the way of economic development. It has to come in the way of something that's much greater than, hi, let us come down and build you a house, or let us come and build you a school, and let us come and give away handouts. If we keep giving handouts, what we create is dependency. So there is nothing I would love to see more. This is, this is the Chris North soapbox right now, opinion soapbox. This is not, OK? I, I, I want to make that really clear. There is nothing I would love to see more in Ada, Ohio than for us to get rid of the Ada Ohio Food Pantry as we know it and turn it into the Ada Ohio Food Co-op where people can come in, they get handouts for two, three, four times. And then beyond that, if you are in that kind of a chronic situation where you need food assistance on such a regular basis that you're needing to come every single month then beyond the four or five times it takes you in an emergency kind of a setting, because yes, there are emergencies that are crises where you need that. I get that. But if it's becoming a maintenance situation, then we need a different model. And then that model becomes more of a development model. So then you become part of a food co-op. And you become part of the solution for yourself and for the community where you contribute back. And so you learn how to help run that food co-op. You learn how to take inventory. You learn how to order from a food co-op. You contribute to the system in terms of how do we buy? How do we buy effectively? How do we do inventory? How do we keep track of the other people? How do we? And that's a development model. That's not a handout, because handouts create dependency. Welfare is a handout. It doesn't, the minute, Unemployment insurance is, is a handout. The minute you get a job, you quit getting unemployment insurance. How does that help? That stops you from being able to develop. Why don't we have a system that encourages you in some way? So it's just easier to do the handout than it is to create a true development. And that's the problem. So we keep going back to what's easier. And believe me, if I had all the answers, I'd have a Nobel Prize somewhere. I don't have all the answers. I can tell you more easily where the issues are than how to fix them. <laughs>